Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to Cave the Cross Projects. I'm Patrick, and uh, for the last two weeks of the year, uh, I decided uh, that we'd start a book at the uh, beginning of the new year and uh, to give us time to kind of work ahead uh, so that the editing is a little bit easier for me. And so I decided um, uh, maybe uh, it would be enjoyable to uh, kind of go through the books that I read this year and uh, kind of... Uh, uh, Steal from Doug Wilson, and he puts out a blog that uh, he then reads in video format, and I thought that was kind of a cool idea. So um, I uh, thought about maybe doing that for the the books that I've read. And so uh, this isn't only theology books, but it's also fiction books. Uh, it's a mixture of uh, traditional publication and also uh, indie pubs. Uh, not all indie pubs are created equal as well, just like traditional pubs at the same time. Uh, and for more good suggestions for good uh, indie publication uh, books, uh, Periapsis Press uh, with the great Katie Room, uh, who we've had on the show before. And so I want to, uh, to give that a shout out for anyone who might think that, uh, that uh, independent writers are, have a low barrier of entry to uh, get stuff out in the world. But uh, um, yeah, so... Uh, uh, if you don't want to listen to the whole episode, that's completely fine. Uh, the format's going to just be uh, the title of the book and then um, kind of what the book says about itself is the overview and then uh, goes into the review. I'll cut up uh, each book or uh, section of books, as you'll see, and um, um, put that on YouTube, Odyssey, and uh, Rumble as well. So that uh, that way, if you uh, are interested in some of the books, that uh, uh, all of them are listed uh, in the description below. Then we can, uh, then you can kind of pick and choose. And of course, the timestamps uh, will be there in, in as well. And so, uh, thank you for uh, giving us some time to to work ahead with uh, our our frame book and um, and making sure that uh, uh, we kind of know what we we're talking about and give us a little bit more time on uh, on the editing. So, thank you. Ten boys who use their talents, and ten girls who use their talents. The Lightkeeper series by Irene Howitt. What can you do for God? These ten boys grew up to become successful men. The two things they have in common is that they all put to good use the talents and gifts that they had, and all believed that God had given them to be used. These ten girls all believe that God had given them special gifts, and they put those talents to use. What are your gifts, and how can you use them to spread God's kingdom? Review. This is the first of the series of ten, five involving boys and five involving girls, geared towards elementary school age and homeschool learning. I think the whole series is going to be delightful. And it was. In this volume, ten boys include Paul Brand, Gilead Prance, C.S. Lewis, C.T. Studd, Wolfred Grenfeld, John Sebastian Bach, uh, James Clerk Maxwell, Samuel Morris, George Washington Carver, and John Bunyan. It follows a similar uh, pattern story of about 15 pages each, so really digestible. The section starts off with a childhood and family setting and moves to either some early important events or through to teenage and college age, and then into adulthood of what they're kind of known for. The stories include mostly fictional conversations, so as to give young readers more than just facts to remember. The conversations are in the spirit of learning about that person. Each person also has a focus on their Christian faith, and it usually inspires the conclusion of the story as a way to glorify God. At the end, there is a fact of the story expanded upon, a keynote that focuses on the aspect of the story to which about God, a think area in which a challenge question is presented for discussion, and a prayer section. As the title suggests, the concentration is on each person's talent that led them to something they are famous for, and how God used these talents to bless others. This could be in the scientific field, the arts, missionary, and ministry, or invention. The stories are long enough to create a story arc, but not so long as that someone interested in another story couldn't move along. For the adults, we sometimes have trouble discovering new topics to study, and sometimes like this uh, could give one idea of someone to read about, or a time period, or subject matter. The only thing I wish the book would do is maybe suggest a few expanded reading books, but that's easy enough to do on one's own these days. One of my favorite areas of this book is that it does not glance over or ignore death, hardships, or troubles. The more I teach my children about their learning, other people's lives, and even my own life as well as an example, 
I find focusing on the failures as well as the triumphs are just as important to give, to learn, and grow. I would highly recommend this book and series, and assuming they all are similar. Final grade, A. The first entry into the girls section of the series, it's just not as good as the boys, and the flaw resides not in the subject matter of it being women, but in how well the boys' stories were structured, and the girls were not. In this volume, 10 girls include Harriet uh, Beecher Stowe, Mildred Cable, Sarah Edward, Annie Lawson, Annie Lawton, Maureen McKenna, Katie Ann McKinnon, Selena, Countess of Huntington, Helen McAmon, uh, Patricia St. John, and Mary Verhess. Follows each of the same stories of about 15 pages each. I really enjoyed the boys' version of this entry. It had details from their childhood that built up in the career path or missionary work or what talents they would end up developing along the way. Their coming to Christ was included and specific enough to also be built into the abbreviated storyline. The conclusion combined everything into what was the outcome of their lives using the talents talked about earlier. How it fails to do that here for the most part. Other than a few medically trained women, there aren't really any talents developed within the storyline. The women chosen did some great things, but it fails to build the talent, and it comes off as the, this girl did a thing. That's not the story in the boys' section. The story of coming to faith feels very thrown in here as well, and feels, for many of the stories, just a thing that the girls came to. The positive aspects of this book is that it brings many unknown women from church history to young readers. However, the impact of their lives and their talents just aren't there. For example, Sarah Edwards, wife of Jonathan Edwards, is a pretty amazing woman who faced a lot of hardships in her life, but her and her family's life, but her story doesn't build her childhood into the overall story. She seems to just happen to come to faith in Christ. She lives a hard life, but glorifies God in some sense. Then she dies. The story isn't cohesive, and it isn't compelling like Gilead Prance with his botany. That was a perfect story written for the boys' side. Having the high task of writing about a group of people who were just as important to Christ's kingdom, but not as always focused on, this really fell flat, and it's a shame that it did. It's not a terrible book at all, or terribly written, it just missed the cohesiveness of the boys' version. Final grade, C-. How to Read Paintings, Western Art Explored Through a Close Reading of Painted Masterpieces by Christopher P. Jones. Overview. How to Read Paintings provides a fascinating an analysis of a variety of paintings made in the Western tradition. Note images are shown in full color. From works by Raphael to Monet, this wide-ranging book will introduce you to the selection of popular paintings and teach you how to understand their meaning. Along the way, the author provides the basic criteria to consider when looking at works of art, giving you a new perspective on art history. By exploring what the pictures actually show, including their symbolism, story, and composition, this illustrated guide will make you your appreciation of paintings and artwork a more rewarding experience. Review. Believe it or not, I enjoy reading things as seen by really reviews of books, movies, shows, games, etc. And one thing that I want to be able to enjoy more of is how to be able to look at a piece of art and be able to see the things artists have placed in them that I may miss because I don't know the art knowledge of what metaphorical analogies are tied to things or the shape of bodies make in the frame of things like that. So that's why I picked up a Jones's book. First of all, the Kindle version of this has all the colored photos, so reviews of the book about them being in black and white are no longer relevant. The art pieces picked uh, come from many different time periods and artists. However, there seems to be a stopping point before the modern postmodern period, which makes sense if a meaning is relative to the observer or no meaning is possible. The author does a good job of providing a background to the artist and time period the uh, painting was done in. There is a discussion of the paintings and what can be seen and some things to notice about the paintings, although not a lot of detail, which is a slight benefit. However, with all that good, the book fails at its premise title. You don't get an idea of how one should read paintings from looking at these examples. From time to time, there might be something of a note, like a mirror representing a look into the void or something along those lines. Other than that... Uh, these specific paintings, I'm unsure if I could take the reading to other paintings, let alone the same artist or even paintings in the same series. There is a helpfulish chapter at the end of the book giving tips on how to appreciate art in a museum, which was good. However, one of the tips is to not look at the plaque right away. Yet the book provides a lot of background and time period information that lends information to many of these paintings, which seems to defeat the purpose of obtaining knowledge from observation alone. 
So while the piece picked are interesting and broad enough in scope, the fact is that you don't really get information on what the title of the book promises. The history and biography are appreciated, and I would have enjoyed it as long as it was included with the toolkit of general guidelines of how to look at a painting or obtain meaning from common symbols or main themes and derivation of meaning. A decent art book on these specific paintings, but a failure on the main premise of the title. Final grade, C-. minus. Ten boys who didn't give in, and ten girls who didn't give in. Inspiring stories of martyrs, like Keeper Series, by Irene Howard. Overview. These ten boys grew up in hard times throughout history to become men who didn't give in to the pressure against their faith. Living as a Christian was difficult, but they chose to do the right thing instead of the easy thing. In a world where we were given too easily to be inspired by the true stories of those who didn't. These ten girls grew up to become women who didn't give in. Living as Christians was difficult. They chose to do the right thing instead of the easy thing. Would you give in or would you resist in a world where we give in too easily, be inspired by those who didn't? These women chose eternal life, love, and joy through obedience, hardship, and life-threatening and life-taking danger. Review. The second entry in the series is just as good as the first, although uh, the subject matter may be a bit too much for younger readers. In this volume, ten boys include Polycarp, Alban, Sir John Oldcastle, Thomas Cramner, George Wishart, uh, James Chalmers, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Nate Saint, Ivan Mosseved, and Graham Staines. It's probably best for young readers to le- read alongside a parent, as the subheading is not included on the book cover, but is listed online. The topics all cover people who were martyred and involve some details of death, cannibalism, and torture. Mind you, there isn't graphic descriptions, and I don't have a negative review about that, as I believe the stories like this are very important, but I think the warning is important. Either way, the series does capture people who are willing to die for their faith, and the questions at the end cover that fairly well. There are deeper conversations to be had within the people covered. The childhood stories don't flow into the climax of the story as much as the first book did, but the pattern is important for the narrative and invests young readers into. Another great entry in the series that allows for the conversation to take place for a number of people, including first world Christians, to get a sense of what holding to their faith sometimes requires. Those who desire to be missionaries and the mindset one might have to have, and those who support missionaries with prayer and money and what they might have to go through, this series really does a good job of showing us why church history is important to study and to learn from. Final grade, A. The second entry into the girls series is better than the first. For the give-in portion, the girls described are probably lesser known and written a little less violent than the boys' version. Yet the impact of the story is still strong. In this volume, ten girls include Belladina, Perpetua, Lady Jane Grey, Anna Askew, Lyskin Dirks, Marion Harvey, Margaret Wilson, Judith Werberg, Betty Stamm, and Esther John. I caution the probable need for parents to read alongside their children with these stories as they involve slightly graphic accounting without details leading to grotesque details. These stories don't have as much, uh, but parents should still caution depending on the age and maturity of the child. I'm still so impressed that the author can boil down a lot of history into 15 pages while understanding that there isn't going to be full coverage on the topic. One of the best ones that had to be the hardest but were, was probably the most enjoyable to read was Lady Jane Grey. The focus on her story could have easily be, been lost in providing the history of wanting to include more detail or greater impact. The older stories taken from earlier histories of church history may cause some to be wanting as details like coming to Christ or childhood specifics just aren't really known. The author also has the biggest slant towards the English side of martyrdom stories, as some involve multiple tales from the Scottish Covenanters uh, and, and that era. Uh, that it's neither a positive nor a negative. The balance and tie-ins from uh, other eras of girls' life from the stories is a lot better done here than uh, in the Girls Who Use Their Talents book. I thought really missed the mark. Another good installment in the series, and I would recommend a short snippet of church history that gives you a quick read on many people that you could take and read more on. Final grade, A minus. You wouldn't want to be a Sumerian slave, a life of hard labor you'd rather avoid. You wouldn't want to be series by Jacqueline Morley. Overview. This fun and interesting interactive series will enthrall young readers by making them a part of the story. Readers will become the main character and can reveal and can revel in the gory, dark, horrific side of life throughout important moments in history. Humorous handy hints that relate 
directly to the text are provided on each spread. Review. I was reading this to my daughter for supplemental reading for their classical conversations, Cycle 1. The whole series looks quite interesting. It provides a snapshot of life in the various places and times that has a POV aspect to the story. There isn't a complete narrative, as there are mostly facts listed, but it helps to put those facts into a kind of semi-story for kids to grab onto more. The book covers general life of a low-class child with their family. It shows what place and time they are in, what tools and materials are around them, and what food and work is done. From there, the main character is sold into slavery, and you see life in the upper class, and the priest's echelon. There isn't coverage on anything over G-rated material other than slavery and paganism. There is even a great section talking about Sumerian's version of the Noah's global flood, which really was a great pause point uh, to cover that subject with my kids. While direct reading everything on all the pages wouldn't would be a bit much for two kids under uh, seven or eight, a quick skim of the pages allows you to pull out what you may want to highlight and provides a good general overview of all the details you will probably want to hit on in your study about Sumer. Final grade, A minus. Ten Boys Who Made History and Ten Girls Who Made History, Light Keeper Series by Irene Howard. Overview. These Christian stalwarts were once young boys playing games, learning from mistakes, and growing up in quite a different world. But was it that different? Irene Howitt re has researched the lives of these men of God and draws out lessons we can all relate to, especially youngsters today. These boys made history. These Christian women were once little girls playing with dolls, making mistakes, and growing up in quite a different world. But was it that different? Irene Howitt had researched the lives of these famous women of God and draws out lessons we can all relate to, especially youngsters today. Review. The third entry into the series is similar to the first Talents book. These include probably some of the more popular people someone has heard of. It's a very good inclusion in the series with a minor flaw. In, the, in this volume, 10 boys include Charles Spurgeon, Jonathan Edwards, Samuel Rutherford, D.L. Moody, Martin Lloyd-Jones, A.W. Tozer, John Owen, Robert Murray McChain, Billy Sunday, and George Whitfield. This entry might have been a good fit entry as it covers some really famous people. What they share in common is that they really are popular preachers or teachers of the Christian faith. It's still really impressive that so much is covered in a few pages. While the stories could import parts of uh, each person's lives, it would have been good to cover more of how they made history. These men are famous, but how they made history isn't really that clear. For example, I didn't know much about Billy Sunday. His story is pretty much that he played baseball, then became a preacher, then he made history. It's not really clear unless the standard is that they're well known. The flaw of exactly how they made history, not being a highlight, as they could be, it is minor to the important uh, people covered in church history, who rose to fame for good reason. This is a great introduction for those, students or adults, looking to, uh, into studying church history or wondering why these people are well known for being faithful and blessed to inspire us even today. Final grade, A-. minus. The third entry in the girls series differs from the boys version in that I knew very few of the girls who made history. This shows a definite need for church history to cover the role of women more, and these books do a great job with that introduction. In this volume, 10 girls include Ida Shudder, Betty Green, Janet Lee, Mary Jane Kinnard, Bessie Adams, Emma Dreyer, Lottie Moon, Florence Nightingale, Henrietta Mears, and Elizabeth Elliot. One of my favorite stories was learning about Betty Green. It was impressive to see that she did in the role of aviation so soon after Lindbergh and even during post-World War II. And even my daughter took her as kind of uh, an area to, uh, to, to research, so these books really helped there. However, my biggest complaint is that many of these stories is that many times the who made history or who made a difference doesn't really forge ahead in the story. Sure, you can make the case for them or offer details in the story, but that shouldn't be needed within the scope of the desired title. For example, I, know, I knew who Florence Nightingale was. And most people probably have heard her name. Yet the story doesn't really cement how she's so known even in pop culture. There are a couple who I still don't really know. Uh, what they did to make history in this book. All that being said, these are still great little stories to introduce you to people in church history, and reading the story of Betty Green to my young girls was a lot of fun and a moving experience. Final grade, B+. Emma, Emergent Movement of Militant Anarchists by Michael Sedney. Overview. Imagine a couple of young hacktivists 
both former members of the Internet Freedom Fighters group, Anonymous, and one of them, an ex-Black Ops officer, breaking away and creating a militant group of anarchists committed to social change. But social change uh, precipitates by acts of violence against CEOs of major corporations responsible for crimes against humanities. Their group, Emergent Movement of Militant Anarchists, or EMMA, believes the power elite will never listen to hollow threats or become intimidated by pranksters like Anonymous. They will listen only when they are focused to live in a state of terror. This is an indie pub. Overview. Reading the synopsis really hit the interesting points to me. Techno thriller, espionage, hacking, hacktivist, detective, anarchism. It all starts the story off strong. Unfortunately, it's a very middle-of-the-road novel that doesn't really take any of those tasks through in an interesting way. It doesn't show uh, hackers or Kevin Mitnick knowledge of anything cyber-related. The espionage is a bad guy that does, doesn't does really show up until the last 10 pages of the book with no real motive and no real need to take the route he did. The detective story pretty much boils down to the suspect calling the detective and giving him all the details. It's the Riddler. As for anarchism, either right or left, I couldn't really tell where the author was coming from. At certain points, it seemed like some of the characters, and therefore the author, supports a left-center viewpoint, but then there's a very misstatement about Silk Road. Silk Road never had child photos or hitman available, as the founder had a non-aggression principle as the basis for it. Free Russ Albrick. It's not all bad, but it didn't really deliver on any one of those genre points. It was also difficult to tell whose POV the audience was supposed to follow, and the flipping between past and present didn't really do much to endear any character in reading it. There is an interesting character with a more than photographic memory, uh, but then she disappears from the story towards the end. Really a shame that she wasn't fleshed out more. Final grade, D. Ten Boys Who Made a Difference and Ten Girls Who Made a Different Lightkeeper series by Irene Howard. Overview. Would you like to make a difference? These ten boys grew up to do just that. But first, they had to change the church. Would you like to make a difference? These ten girls grew up to do just that. Review. This is the final boys book in the series of ten. Five involving boys and five involving girls. I went in the series really liking the format, layout, and subject material. The ending, while kind of focusing on one theme, is still a valuable tool for young people to learn about our church history. In this volume, ten boys include Augustine of Hippo, Jan Hus, Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, William Tyndale, Hugh Latimer, John Calvin, John Knox, the Lord Shaftesbury, and Thomas Chalmers. What a collection of men to go out on. Some of the biggest reformers over the period really risked a lot and really made, did make a difference in returning the church back to its first love, the gospel of grace. While eight of the boys covered focus on uh, the Reformation and the breakaway from the Roman Catholic Church and return to orthodoxy, it's odd that two other boys were different. Throughout the history of the Reformation and the different countries and flavors, there are many names to choose from. Yet, two boys covered were quite interesting to learn about, and the lives showed the series of subject as true to form. I always enjoyed when the subjects or difficulties the author covers in the childhood are brought out in the main part of their stories. I would highly recommend this book and the series. The teaching of church history is something that I've found has only strengthened and informed many uh, and informed my faith. And having this format is perfect for young readers to start their journeys into making a difference in church history. Final grade, A minus. The final entry into the girls series and the final book in this entire series, the whole series was a joy to read and to review and to learn from. This entry had me slightly apprehensive that it would only be the wife of or the mother of great men. While they share those qualities among themselves, the author does a good job of highlighting them as individuals. In this volume, 10 girls include Catherine Luther, Beth. Bethan Lloyd-Jones, Sabina Wombrand, Susan Wesley, Anna Judson, Edith Schaefer, Ruth Bell Graham, Monica of Thasgate, Susanna Spurgeon, and Maria Taylor. As stated above, this looks like women who made a difference because their husbands or sons made a difference. While some of these might fall into this a little more, and the women are shown coming alongside the men in their lives, so someone like Monica of Thadsgate is the focus because of Augustine. But that's also because what we know of her comes from her son and shows the impact mothers have. One of the best stories is Edith Schaefer, who seems to just be an amazing person who made Libri an even a more special place. 
What this book maybe could have focused on a little more is actually showing an even closer connection to how great men are affected by the great women in their life. Someone like Susanna Spurgeon is known for her great love for her husband and supporting him with his consistent bouts of depression. There are other books that talk about this for later study. You can find those in the description and linked below. This book was a nice surprise from what I thought it would be, and that's true for what this whole series was. If you're looking to get your younger kids into church history, or even if you're an adult looking for some entries into who or when to study and read about further, this is the one. And this is, was the book series that we talked about with uh, uh, Troy Frazier uh, in the interview about church history. So I'll link that uh, um, interview below as well. Final grade, A. Our Dark Angel by Mar- Michael Sedgi. Overview. When FBI agent Rick- Richard a. Clark becomes involved in hunting down the leaders of a terrorist group, calling itself ARC, anarchists for real change, he finds himself opening old wounds that threaten to push him over the edge. Our Darker Angel begins with the FBI agent Rick Clark's investigation into a series of murders claimed to have been committed by a group of anarchists. Fighting terrorism has become a personal issue with Clark. Two years before his daughter perished in the terrorist bombing, when a group calling itself Emma discharged a C2 explosive at a political rally, the new murders bear a striking resemblance to the former killings by Emma, as they too targeted the corrupt and powerful. There is one notable difference, though. Ark seems to rely exclusively on the internet to hire low-life assassins desperate to make an easy buck. Review. This sequel to Emma, which I reviewed previously, takes all the parts of that book and retreads it with some of the even worst elements added. The plot revolves around another clear case of an alleged anarchist group being used as an excuse to execute political figures. There's even less discussion on anarchism or technology than the last book, minus some passing nods to Albert Camus. When I read the first Jack Reacher book, I had the same problem with this, with that as I did this one. The plot turned reveal reveal revolves around a character tied to one of the main characters who just happens to tie into the bigger plot that the author literally makes the character go outside the normal story elements to bring into the fold. There are some elements of either bad editing or time manipulation on behalf of the author that does not occur anywhere else in the book. The character is discovered murder, and then there are about two chapters that happens before the murder actually happens. The characters from the previous book are barely in this and really don't add anything to the plot, as mostly new characters are brought up to follow for this plot. One of the main characters reacts to a murder that is so rushed and unbelievable that it almost made me think the victim wasn't even related to the character. Just get drunk one time, and then it's back to the investigation, and you're already on a, a, a part of uh, with n- no real emotional deal. The other characters brought about almost feel schizophrenic and make choices that don't follow what was already uh, established. The amount of sex and language in this book brought up was not included in the last book, and it felt very out of place here. This isn't a James Axler series. The conclusion is so rushed what happened in the first book, too. The break in the case is discovered, and it's it's just a rush of the story to get to the end of the book. What little the first book offered was jettisoned in the sequel for an even more meandering plot and trivial characterization. On top of that, the book covers is ridiculous and borders on false advertising. Final grade, F. Recovering the Lost Tools of Learning by Douglas Wilson. Review. The public education in America has run into hard times. Even many within the system admit that it is failing. While many factors contribute, Douglas Wilson lays much of the blame on the idea that education can take place in a moral vacuum. It is not possible for education to be non-religious, deliberately excluding the basic questions about life. All education builds on the foundation of someone's worldview. Education deals with fundamental questions that require religious answers. Learning to read and write is uh, is simply the process of acquiring the tools to ask and answer such questions. A second reason for the failure of public schools, Wilson feels, is modern uh, teaching methods. He argues for a return to the classical education, firm discipline, and the requirement of hard work. Often, education reforms create new problems that must be solved down the road. This book presents alternatives that have proved workable in experience. Review. The good thing about reading a book about classical education is that even if you're reading a book from 1991 in 2022, the core of the details won't really change. Wilson breaks up the book into three main parts. The first part is the declining nature of public education and the failure of the American education system. This was in a day without a critical race theory or pushing of trans or gay embracement, 
where the biggest thing to worry about was only drugs and violence and no school-led prayer. Ah, the good old days. There are some good statistics that are still available here, and even 20 years removed have probably gotten only worse. It does not get bogged down in trying to prove the terribleness of government schools, but highlights main areas where the call to go towards classical education is necessitated. The second part is a call for Christian education. The need to build one's educational platform is highlighted on the need to have Christian worldview foundation. The separation between what a Christian worldview looks like and an American view is probably better highlighted today, and the expanse between the two is divided further. This is where classical education is introduced, and rightly so, as as some might view the topic as just reading the old stuff. So the need to view the old stuff, and even the secular stuff, both old and new, needs to be filtered through the Christian worldview. With presuppositionalism, Greg Bonson, Van Til being more known today, or maybe more known to me, this is also an evergreen idea. The final part is seeing what classical education is like, and the case study of Wilson's Logo School is used to show the model. This was probably a foreign idea in 1991, but as an introduction to the topic in 2022, where your audience is probably more acceptable to the idea, more ideas of what it looked like uh, is probably uh, would probably be beneficial. I would have liked to have seen more direct contrast between the public education model and the classical model in coverage than in outcomes. It is there, but further detail would have been nice. A portion that was really beneficial was unseen why learning Latin was an important tool. It's not just to learn it so you, one can brag about knowing the subject, but the utility in both reading and other subjects are improved in learning Latin. Probably the least helpful section was Wilson's critique of homeschooling. And I understand that uh, a newer book uh, has come about and he's kind of uh, changed some of his uh, expressions here. But again, a charity should be granted for this book was in 1991, where an increase is in ever even knowing about homeschooling to the reader was probably low. However, Wilson doesn't really make his case for homeschooling, and especially those that homeschool in a classical curriculum or co-op. While this is the least helpful section, it's an ancillary topic to the more important goal to learn about classical education. This is a quick read for someone to get a primer in understanding or uh, beginning or being convinced of classical education. Even the 1991 statistics, one can skip the first part of the book and read the part about Christian worldview education, which is the second part, or what is classical education, which is the third part. The appendix offers some tools and even example curriculum to get a direct showing of what in, what's involved in classical education. Still, a, a good introduction book on the classical approach to education. Final grade, B+. Plus. Ten Boys Who Changed the World, Ten Girls Who Changed the World, Like Keeper Series, by Irene Howard. Overview. Would you like to change the world? These ten boys grew up just to do that. Find out how. Read this book and find out what God wants you to. Would you like to change the world? These ten girls did. Read this book and find out how. Read this book to find out what God wants you to do. Review. The fourth entry into this boys series shows that church history is filled with all sorts of interesting and forgotten people. While this volume probably has more famous folks, there are still elements to be discovered. In this volume, 10 boys include David Livingston, Nikki Cruz, Brother Andrew, George Mueller, uh, William Carey, John Newton, Adoram uh, Judson, uh, Billy Graham, Louis Palou, and Eric Liddell. I believe this will be my last time highlighting this negative aspect of the book because I believe I may be putting too much stock in what the title is promising me. With the title involving people who changed the world, I was thinking there would be more discussion to the impact of that person. For example, Eric Liddell is a famous person, but how he exactly changed the world seems confined to his running and POW time. Of course, there are men, uh, there is more to his story, and this story in relation to his faith is important and a blessing. However, change the world is hard to see. A Louis Paulu story is last, and I'm not at all sure why the ending had to do with him and or overall why he's highlighted among the people here. Putting my complaints against the promise of the title away for good, the stories are enjoyable. They also cover a wide variety of different times and places. I believe homeschool families could cover one story and get a history, geography, devotional, and English lesson out of reading one chapter per lesson. Really, do pick these up for the younger readers in your life. Final grade, B+.
Taking Hold of God, Reformed and Puritan Perspectives on Prayer, edited by Joel Beakey and Brian Najapur. Overview. In Taking Hold of God, you will enter the treasury of the Church of Jesus Christ and discover some of the most valuable gems on the subject of Christian prayer. The writings of the Reformers and Puritans shine with the glory of God in Christ, offering us much wisdom and insight today that can make our own prayer lives more informed, more extensive, more fervent, and more effectual. Six con- contemporary scholars explore the writings and prayer lives of several reformers and Puritans, among them Martin Luther, John Calvin, William Perkins, Matthew Henry, and Jonathan Edwards, guiding us to growth in prayer and more grateful communion with God. Review. In my never-ending quest to become better at prayer, who else should I turn to but to the reformers, the Puritans, and Joel Beakey, a book that is well-researched and structured with only a few hiccups. Taking many resources and boiling them down with one topic had to be an endeavor and shows why there are many co-authors here. An encouraging and good gut-punching ending, this was a good overview on prayer. Covering Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, William Perkins, Anthony Burgess, John Bunyan, Matthew Henry, Thomas Boston, Jonathan Edwards, and then a splattering of other reformers and Puritans, each author takes his theologian and structures the writings on a particular topic. Where Luther, Calvin, and Knox get to introduce prayer and hit it from many angles, others get a different approach. Perkins has the Lord's Prayer, Burgess and Bunyan have prayers of the Son and the Spirit, Henry has the form of how to pray, Boston on the personalness of prayer, Edwards has prayer to the triune God, and the last two chapters cover how many theologians prayed for evangelism and a general call to seek out prayer. Book book starts off really strong with the first the three theologians getting a lot of territory on the subject. Perkins' Lord's Prayer portion feels a little removed, and it doesn't quite get into the practical perspective for the reader, but there is a great read just on his thoughts and personal application can be had with the material if one were to do so on their own. Honestly, the weakest inclusion here is Edwards. While Edwards didn't write specifically on prayer, it's not as if he didn't talk about it. However, his inclusion here feels like they need to include something by the Master Edwards. Not that it isn't informative, but it could have been left out. The last chapter really stands out as someone who appreciates a book on application of theology to punch me in the gut and challenge me uh, through ridicule, threat, and the benefit that is a good ow factor that I appreciated. The book is well cited as well, so further reading can be done and is good to introduce to who uh, the big reformers and Puritan names are. It didn't answer all my questions I wanted to answer, but it did a really good job of doing exactly what you want this book to do. Drive you to prayer, pray more, or get serious about prayer. Final grade, A-. minus. You wouldn't want to be an Assyrian soldier, an ancient army you'd rather not join. You wouldn't want to be serious, by Rupert Matthews. Overview. Humorous handy hints that relate directly to the text are provided on each spread. High interest topics for children of all ages includes a table of contents, glossary, and index, draws in even the most reluctant reader with a lighthearted tone and hilarious illustrations. The cultures and traditions of ancient civilizations spring to life in these pages of the series. Perfect for struggling readers, grades K through 4, social studies. Time, continuity, and change accounts of past events, people, places, Situations contribute to our understanding of the past. Cultures, people, societies, and cultures address needs and concerns in ways that are both similar and different. Review. I was reading this to my daughters for supplemental reading for their classical conversation, Cycle 1. The whole series looks to be quite interesting. It provides a snapshot of life in various places, times, and has a POV aspect to the story. There isn't a complete narrative, as there are mostly facts listed, but it helps put those facts into a semi-story for kids to grab onto more. With this entry, the story starts out with the character before life in the military to to contrast it from life within the military and what it looks like. From there, the discussion of military training, jobs within the military, weapons, and attack tactics are discussed. It's nice to see uh, and get into some of the details of military service other than just the standard infantry soldier, although that is also covered. The character moves up in ranks, but again, there's no real story of it happening just using the character as a foil for the information plundering looting and warfare are discussed but there is no violence or bloodshed on one hand it's not needed to discuss the amount of violence but the purpose of the book is why you wouldn't want to be an assyrian soldier and by the time of retirement it seems the only thing that makes it something you wouldn't want to do uh, or be is because of the hard work and tiring conditions 
On the other hand, not discussing the lifespan of a trooper or what happens uh, if you were wounded could have been discussed without uh, depictions of a graphic violence. Overall, providing a snapshot of military life and a way of life during the Assyrian Empire was important for the girls to learn about and provided for further discussion of Assyrian paganism and the times during which they reigned. Final grade, B. Recovering the Lost Art of Reading, A Quest for the True, the Good, and the Beautiful by Leland Riken, Glenda Mathis. Overview. In today's technology-driven culture, reading has become a lost art. With smartphones offering information on the tap of fingers, reading a book is often seen as a tedious and outdated activity. Christians are not immune to this problem, as many find it hard to read books, even the Bible, consistently and attentively. Recovering the Lost Art of Reading addresses these timely issues by exploring the importance of reading generally, as well as studying the Bible as literature, giving practical suggestions along the way. In this helpful guide, Leland Riken and Glenda Faye Mathis encourage a new generation of readers to overcome the notion of reading as a duty and learn to see it as a delight. Review. What I liked most about this book is twofold. One, it wasn't a lament about how these people today are just too stupid to really read a book. It does provide a three-part look that identifies that, indeed, people's reading comprehension has been limited by a de-emphasis on critical, genre-specific reading. The other is the use of specific quotes from authors to really make their case for each topic they speak about. There are some real good gems that I grabbed as the love of books, reading, and literature. The authors do come at the subject from a Christian worldview, which they want to focus all literature through. However, non-Christians can also read this book to get a lot from it. Yet the authors rightly attribute the Christian worldview in making possible literature. Quote, the very example of the Bible established the necessity of literature in the Christian life. Scripture does more than sanction literature. It shows us that literature is indispensable in knowing and communicating our most important truths. End quote. Part one establishes the issue to show the art of reading is lost. That is a critical thinking way of reading and not just one for entertainment and enjoyment. Defining the problems flows to the other two parts. Part two was my favorite part of the book. It defined literature as, quote, a concrete interpretive presentation of human experience in an artistic form, end quote, and why it's important. Then they looked at different genres and expressed that each one was what, what each one was, what they do, and the tips on how best to read them. Stories, poems, novels, fantasy, sci-fi, children's books, nonfiction, and the Bible as literature were discussed. There is a really interesting discussion on escapism versus literature as an escape in fantasy and sci-fi section. From the nonfiction section, the discussion on balancing the story structure and telling the truth was also an interesting discussion. Probably the most helpful one was reading poems, and the most practical was reading children's books. All of them went back to the touchstones of the Christian worldview. Part three was a more practical take on reading in general. I would have actually liked to have seen part two and three switched as I saw how to read literature to fulfill the main premise of the book. Here in part three, the author talked about that very important and overlooked truth that there is no neutral viewpoint and the importance of worldview is discussed here. This is almost a topic for another book entirely, but the subject was well covered enough. And alongside, it is a good discussion on objective beauty, especially in literature. Truth-telling and reality-based relationships between whatever genre or subject and the reader were also good points to discuss to help fill in some of the missing parts of a critical read. The section ended with a call to find someone, to find some time to read and the distractions in place that prevent us, and to also check out good books. There are many good ideas in this book that are worthy of conversation and challenging someone who likes to read but maybe never looked into it more. The call for critical reading isn't a call to never have fun reading again or to be stuffy in your reading. It's a call that you shouldn't turn off a part of your brain while reading anything and evaluating what you're reading through your worldview is another layer that is missed that should be done by everyone. While part three gets a little meandering at times, overall this book is a good book to check out, especially for Christians and those who enjoy reading or teaching or reading in homeschool settings. Final grade, B+. Praying the Bible by Donald S. Whitney. Overview. All Christians know they should pray, but sometimes it's hard to know how, especially if the minutes start to drag and our minds start to wander. Offering readers hope, encouragement, and practical advice they're looking for, this concise book by Professor Donald Whitley 
outlines a simple, time-tested method that can help transform our prayer lives. Pray in the words of the Bible. Pray in the Bible shows readers how to pray through portions of Scripture one line at a time, helping us stay focused by allowing God's Word itself to direct our thoughts and words. Simple yet profound, this resource will prove invaluable to all Christians as they seek to commune with their Heavenly Father in prayer each and every day. Review. This is a difficult book to review. On one hand, the topic is important and covered well. On the other hand, there's not much to say past a few chapters. This really could just have been a book pamphlet rather than a book just over 100 pages. There isn't a, this isn't a slight against the author either. Whitney lays out the issue. You seem to pray the same thing over and over. Then it becomes a routine rather than a relationship. Check. He lays out the thing to do. Pray the Bible. And a good place to start is Psalms. The most important part is whether one should be concerned about taking the verses out of context if you're praying. The nuance covered here is the most important part after the pray the Bible part, uh, and his answer makes logical and practical sense. The answer is pretty much, don't worry about it too much. You don't want to pray heresy or just go in wildly, but the goal is to get out of the rut of boring prayers and being inspired by the text to prayer. It, it is exactly the goal. From there, he spends a couple chapters going through examples of praying the Psalms and other parts of the scripture. This is really just a review of what he's already done and made his point well enough in the preceding chapters. Finally, there are a few review and example chapters that seem superfluous. So overall, it is a good book and really straightforward. However, if it is so straightforward that it's not worth the book format, unless you really need to be walked through the process, it's a hard review for sure. This review didn't provide you with enough details, then pick up the book. If not, go and do it. It really makes a lot of sense. Final grade, C. Prayer, How Praying Together Shapes the Church, Nine Marks, Building Healthy Church Series, by John Awawakachenwa. Overview. Prayer is, an, is as necessary to the Christian as breathing is to the human body, but it often doesn't come quite as naturally. In fact, prayer in the church often gets subtly pushed to the side in favor of pragmatic practices that promise tangible results. Rather than being a hallmark of churches, dependence on prayer is usually emphasized only in times of major crisis, if at all. The latest book in the Nine Marks Building Healthy Churches series focuses on the necessity of regular prayer as the central practice in the local church. Examining what Jesus taught about prayer, how the first Christians approached prayer in the early church, and what steps can be taken to prioritize prayer in churches, this book is intended to awaken readers to the need and blessings of prayer in their personal lives, and in the lives of their local church. Review. Having read a few of the other Nine Marks books before, I understand the direction of the book is writing it for the corporate work of the church. In this book, the focus isn't on just prayer in general, but on specific confines of corporate worship. The books are designed to be primers and not extensively treaties on the subject, so not everything can be covered. So with that, this book does a decent job of establishing that churches should pray corporately. It provides the scripture and key concepts needed to show you the basics. The problem, however, is that it's a bit too general. The book starts off by giving you an overview of prayer and how to pray, using, of course, the Lord's Prayer as the model. It uses it to break down the key points of what pr to pray for. It then goes into the fact that churches need to pray together. However, the structure of this part of the book meanders, and it's not until much later that you figure out that the author is talking about just about praying in something like Sunday meetings, times, or holding specific prayer meetings. there, There's also not a discussion of elder, deacon, church leadership prayer, small group prayer, or specific areas of other parts of the church, shut-ins, the sick, those under church discipline. Maybe that's not the intention that the author wanted to cover or convey, yet it seems like the first half is for a different book on prayer in general or goes on a bit too long on general prayer for this type of book. There are also two times the author points to specific examples of church prayer because of a recent, in 2016, police-involved shooting. There are not many examples in this book, which can be another negative towards it, but these examples seem to cover and come from out of the blue and don't fit in the overall structure of where they are located in the book or the book's layout. Overall, it's a book to convince you that you and your church should pray. Probably not a hard sell. However, overall, it is a too general to be that useful in my opinion. But if you're starting at zero, it might be a book worth that's worth it. Final grade, C. Alfred the Great by Justin Pollard. Overview. 
Alfred was England's first king, and his rule spanned troubled times. As his shores sat under constant threat from Viking marauders, his life was similarly imperiled by conspiracies in his own court. He was an extraordinary character, a soldier, scholar, statesman like no other in English history. And out of the adversity, he forged a new kind of nation. Justin Pollard's enthralling account strips back centuries of myth to reveal the individual behind the legend. He offers a radical new interpretation of what inspired Alfred to create England and how it has colored the nation's history to the present day. Review. The danger of homeschooling children is that you end up finding a historical figure who seems really interesting and grabs the imagination as someone who is unique for his or her time. This goes for Alfred the Great for me. While it seems that most people, in the UK at least, know him for two stories, one of graciously being scolded by a peasant woman for being inattentive over some baked bread, and another for challenging himself to read in a very early age to gain a book, it also seems that these two stories are only attributed to him, but probably didn't happen. What makes him more interesting is that he embodies a hero's journey in his rule and his encouraging of learning and reading of his people. Pollard's book has an ironic nature to its strength, being one of the greatest weaknesses, also depending on why you're, you're reading it, as someone who doesn't know about the time, the 9th or 10th century or place, uh, which is Wessex and then uh, England in general, this provides a lot of background information on the culture, history, and people groups of society. While this book isn't extraordinarily long and does require uh, and does read quite quickly, it provides a lot of background information, so much so that the title character of the book, Alfred, tends to kind of get lost in a number of pages. It takes a run-up to his life and rule, which is appreciated. However, once you get into the wars with the Vikings, you almost kind of forget what you're reading about. And yet, understanding just how formidable the Vikings were and the nuance that they enacted against king, country, and the people is impressive. Also, the discussion on how women had a different role that the, quote, subject of men of their fathers, unquote, that we think about was the status throughout history in the West was really interesting and put rightly, of the time into perspective. It's just not the case. It's not the case that they're subject to the to the, the men and the fathers. Really interesting. Also, the idea that absolute monarchy wasn't a thing until much, much later is seen in lesser magistrates coming together and kicking Alfred out of the office of king. Really interesting. Alfred was a young boy who was never would have been king and never wanted to be king, but took on the mantle for his family. He found unique ways to deal with Viking raiders after repossessing the throne. His character, and especially his Christian convictions, is seen throughout the book, and with what little, compared to today, we have uh, of historical knowledge of the time, that is a great testament and challenge to us Christians. As for being a unique character, almost out of his time frame, it would have been interesting to see Alfred 700 years later in the middle of the Reformation to see what he would do. We see his desire for both noble and no normal person alike to learn Latin, to learn to read, and to learn to learn. This was done both as an overall uh, increase in life and faith, but also for the betterment of the kingdom and those who would supplant the older generation. There was a lot of current day life lessons we can get from Alfred's rule. Reforming the legal system and seeing the theonomy of lesser judges who were encouraged to learn by some even uh, through the threat of force to be better judges is an impressive thing to see in the first millennium AD. I would even say that if Alfred's reforms on learning and legalism and leadership had continued well into the second millennium, the advancement of the West would have been even greater than what we saw. So while the details can be a little overwhelming and not Alfred-centric, the second half of the book really centers on him and just how amazing and interesting of a life he led. The sad tale at the start of the book of a number of lost works of antiquity is almost heartbreaking. A study in the life of Alfred would be a good study for any father or church leader or community leader. Seeing the need to build up the next generation from a cultural revolution with a strong leader who provided himself as someone to listen to and trust is a historical truth we can follow. Final grade, B.